Good evening, everyone. I welcome to the second webinar of our first five locum support series, which we call it Diversify Your Career as First Five Locum GP. Thanks for giving up your time to join us tonight. My name is Azad Ghanimi, I'm the Yorkshire First Five lead and the co lead for the First Five community. Due to technical issues, this is a re recorded webinar introduction. We apologise for any inconvenience this might have made. This is the second webinar of our series, which aim to support locum GPs who represent a large core of the first five GP workforce. During the pandemic, we have received feedback from our peers nationwide with some of the challenges that they have been experiencing. So we have decided to organize this series of webinars. A quick recap of previously mentioned concerns, which are work market for locums has become complex, variance in work available, variance in conditions worked in with a number of stories of poor practice. In our first webinar, the speakers addressed the ways they can offer support and the thoughts and approaches to the locum issues, as well as sharing their experiences and knowledge. This webinar is available to watch in our website. Tonight, we are going to listen to the expert on how you can diversify your career and whether you are a locum, salaried or partner, there are opportunities for different types of work, education and development from many different areas. They will talk us through the future of locum and portfolio roles and how to create portfolio work opportunities and also providing some examples of programs across the country, in addition to pathways for recruitment and retention. I'm delighted to welcome our excellent panel of speakers, Dr. Serena Chipper, a co-founder of My Locum Manager, Portfolio GP and Mom of Two. Dr. James Waldron, a Portfolio GP, the Veil vale of Trend First Five co-lead and ICS First Five lead. Melanie Ashdown, she is the CEO for AIM Solutions Limited, supporting NHS primary care workforce through education, training and projects. How things will work. This is an informal webinar and is being recorded so it will be available afterwards to watch if you wish. We are going to hear from the speakers for 30 minutes. Please feel free to add your comments, thoughts, and also your questions in the Q&A function during this time. At the end of the talk, we have 20 minutes for the Q&A. Here, I will aim to reflect on themes of questions and pose them to our speakers. If we don't have time to answer them today, we will endeavour to address them and may consider them for you in a future webinar in our series. And now I'd like to um, hand over to the panel of the speakers, please. All right. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, um, Azza, um, and um, and welcome to our other two speakers as well, um, Mel and and Serena. Really great to have you. Um, I think some people are having a few um, uh, technical issues. We're going to try and resolve those as we go along, but please bear with us. Um, Bryn is doing his best to try and sort that out. Um, if there's any particular problems, please pop it in uh, the chat, and we'll endeavour to get it sorted. So um, I think first of all, um, um, it might be good for us to just go uh, and find out a little bit about who's in the panel. Um, so first, first of all, I'd um, like to hand over to um, Dr. Serena Chibber just to tell us tell us a bit about herself. Um, oh yes, thanks, um, thanks, James. Right, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, if you can, just say yes in the chat box. 
But um, so I'm Serena, I'm a portfolio GP um, and uh, it's really nice to be kind of invited here to speak to you guys. And as, um, as I had said, and James has said, we want this to be really interactive today. So do ask lots of questions. Obviously you're here because you want to know about diversifying, diversifying your career. So um, hopefully together the, the group of us can help you kind of yeah. get on the right path. Yeah. Thanks, and Mel? Hi everyone, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Melanie Ashton and I work with the Southwest London Training Hubs in Southwest London. A lot of the work we do is around workforce and uh, locums are a big part of that workforce. So I'm hopefully able to answer some of your questions and cover some of the things you might be um, wondering. Thank you. Thanks. And, and I'm James and as, as I said, I'm the um, one of the first five leads for um, the co-leads for Nottinghamshire and a few other things um, uh, as well, which we shall sort of get into. Um, we thought that the first thing to help consider why we actually might want to diversify our career and why we might want to uh, add, add, th add strings to our bow, as some people might put it. And we thought it might be helpful to take you through some of our stories. And the way that we're going to sort of run it today is just with a bit of a conversation between the three of us. Um, and please ask questions and we'll, um, we'll aim to sort of ask them as we go, go along. So um, I think probably the first best person to start with would be Serena. Um, with her extremely full slide here. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is everybody essentially my CV. So I kind of I'm in my first five, and um, when I finished training, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I was a mum of one then. I'm now mum of two, and what I did know was um, I knew I didn't want to see patients 24/7. And as much as I love my clinical role, I kind of did think over my year on maternity that. Do you know what? I'm interested in so many different things, but no one could really tell me how I could make a career out of that. So I finished my training and I started to work as a locum. And the way my character was, I just wanted to, I really liked continuity. So I wanted to connect with a few local practices, but I really found the whole self-employed element. So managing all my money, managing my time, building those relationships with practices um, that I needed help with that. So I kind of ended up setting up my locum manager, which is a really popular national software used by lots and lots of locums and portfolio GPs, um, which takes care of all of that. And um, as I developed my portfolio career, um, it became more and more useful because one thing I've noticed and one thing we're going to talk about as portfolio GPs is that actually your role is often you're self-employed or you'll be invoicing. And if you're doing medical, like primary care related portfolio roles, that's um, pensionable. So you need to be able to sort out all the pension and invoice administration, yeah. which is what kind of in the end, I guess, my local managers emulated my career because it, it, it helps facilitate that. Now, my other roles is I'm a presenter for a company called GP Update. So I get to go around the country and present um, kind of on, you know, new ways of working clinically for GPs or the nice guidance updates that have come in. And, and that's a really great and interesting part of my um, learning. And um, also, I, I really, really enjoy the educational aspect of it. My other roles are I'm Macmillan GP for Hounslow, and that involves um, no patient um, kind of interaction but a lot of strategy and working with practices and helping to improve cancer outcomes in that area i write for um a gp magazine called pulse are they a magazine or are they a published publishing i don't know but i write for pulse and um i've been involved with my ccg um and the imperial college and king's college london are there because um as an st one and two i started to teach medical students and I carried on that passion for teaching kind of as I kind of carried on my career. Um, so all in all, I'd say, I would hands down say, I absolutely love my career as a GP. And I, enough, if I'm honest, I didn't think I'd say that when I was a trainee, but I've managed to combine lots of clinical interesting things with what I'm really passionate about. And now I pretty much spend, so I spend 24 seven, seven days a week being a mum of those two monkeys you can see on the slide. And then the rest of the time is split between doing a few sessions, clinical sessions a week, um, running MLM, so running my local manager, and then splitting my time with the other roles that I do. So my week is very varied, but it is very busy. And we're going to talk about kind of when you're doing portfolio roles, what you need to juggle. Yeah. So James, can I have the next slide? Of course. Oh, there you are. Thanks. So one of the things that I kind of wanted to mention, so one of the 
projects and one of the developments that we've been doing with my local manager over the last i'd probably say year is looking at so when you're a um, salary gp or a partner or a locum you need an anchor point in your community where you're working to then start developing portfolio roles and actually um in southwest london for example with fasty healthcare that's just one of the examples of where kind of with my local manager we've basically created an anchor point and community for locum gps and then we're looking to help in, introduce them to lots of different portfolio roles in the area so that they can work flexibly and with autonomy but they can also get a lot of variety and just some examples of how other gps on mlm are doing this some of them um, do locum work but they also do regular core clinics in their area or their special interests are in dermatology which they do as community clinics either as a locum or as a salaried role which they mix in with their locums others are appraisers so there's lots of a variety kind of um, that you can kind of weave into your clinical roles I guess the first point and question everybody has is how am I going to do it and that's what we're also going to talk about today. Yeah. Uh, the anchor I think is really important um, and um, and I think I think a uh, I think a good place to start. Um, Mel, what's what's your experience in this? Um, I would I would say what Serena's um, saying is really important. Having an anchor, perhaps somewhere a base where you can start out your career, is really a good place to um, broaden your experience and your contacts within a region and an area. As a locum. You can imagine a practice hiring in a locum, the kind of things that they think about is, will the person know about the referral pathways and um, the day-to-day -day working? So if you're within a borough and borough-based and become a quite well-known within that uh, locality, it can be helpful for finding work. So I did see one of the questions is, um, how do I find locum work? And with um, within Wandsworth, as um, Serena's mentioned, we've been working with my local manager. One of the key things about working with my local manager is our practices who use the locums on my local manager know those locums. So if you're looking for work, practices typically have a little black book of locums that they like to use, that they know, know the systems and the, the actual protocols for that borough. So my local manager provides that vehicle through which that um, booking arrangement can happen. Yeah, and we've been that black book so kind of since we started so someone's I, I see the question that you're referring to Mel and you know that person saying like everything's dried up and even locum agencies have no work well I think there's there's two types of locums I think me and James are quite similar in the way so we have always kind of directly approached practices where we think Do you know what so for me it was this is near my daughter's nursery I like the look of this practice or one of my friends said this is a good place to work and then I built that connection so when COVID hit me and a lot of those GPs like James who have that direct relationship, even though work's been slightly less, I've been really busy. And actually, you know, I know that when things pick up again, that I'm going to be the first point of call. So I'm not competing with anybody. I've from the beginning managed my own relationships with those practices. Mm -hmm. uh, same with James. And I think those that have been dependent on agencies or where you're on these kind of platforms where you're competing for jobs like yeah it, but for them it is really really difficult and I'd say definitely like just you know contact your local practices and start being proactive I think that's definitely a way to start um yeah. kind of start increasing your work would you agree James yeah one of the one of the best places that I worked actually was uh because it was opposite my gym and it was very convenient and I thought you know what I'm just going to drop them an email and it was an absolutely fantastic place to work and I think that's how I've got most of it and that and word of mouth of other people have had experiences um, so I, I can do one better, James, where I regularly work for about four years now is because it's near a really nice shopping centre. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking about Wandsworth Medical Centre, <laughs> Mel, you'll know that one, but it's, really, yes. so it's such a, but it's a lovely place to work, but it's just really like location wise, it's amazing. But enough about my retail therapy habits. And it, uh, it, I mean, it looks absolutely so. This, this, this slides for sort of Mel, Mel's career to this point, and yeah, there's a huge so, number of things here looking like creating opportunities for people as well. Yes. So, um, in summary, uh, for the listeners, um, I would, it, I am what you would call a typical NHS manager. So, I've had a portfolio career of my own, um, with a bit of time in hospital, ten years in hospital, and then time after that has been working on reconfiguration programs. So in London and also 
for Health Education England and the Department of Health. And a big part of all these reorganization programs has been workforce. So with any big major plan, it's what's our workforce plan and how, is, how are we going to find the workforce to deliver that plan? And part of that is substantive, but a big part of it is recognizing the locum workforce as well, because um, in some areas, at least in Southwest London, we've got um, a, quite a high number of stable locums. So that locum workforce is not going down. So it's about working with that locum workforce. We, as, a, as I said before, we work with my locum manager to, to actually look at ways to support that locum workforce. We can't deny that they exist. So it's about how do we think about the CPD of those people? How do we um, work with them to help them stay in those jobs and, and offer a fulfilling and rewarding career? So this is just my um, overview. NHS uh, manager, but um, you know, the last 10 years have really been heavily focused on workforce and projects relating to workforce. And Mel, one of the things probably, um, well, a lot of the key things you're involved in going forward, um, a large number of areas, is developing these portfolio pathways where GPs can get on and actually very easily start diversifying because currently that's very difficult to do unless you, like, you know, I had to source a lot of this work and it came, I came across it, but you're actually designing these pathways where people can have these, these stable workflows to develop portfolio careers. That's right. And this is very early stage work that we're doing at the moment. We literally launched a fellowships program last week. I'm not sure if our listeners have heard of the NHS fellowships program. It's at different stages in different parts of the country, but we've launched ours last week where um, there is NHS England funding to develop fellowships. And that is open to locum GPs who, who are willing to take on a substantive role. So locum GPs can apply for that as well. It, it's, minimum yeah. and sorry, it's four, four to seven sessions. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think that a lot of what you're talking about is really reflected across the country and there are these uh, schemes and, and uh, approaches to diversifying careers, finding portfolio work, finding different things to make your life uh, you know, enriched and interesting, I think happening all over the country and to a greater and a lesser extent in some places, but everybody's catching up, especially because of the new to practice uh, fellowships that are happening to help, you know, really support and, um, and, and in encourage and develop the GPs that we've had. Um, and and certainly feels like training hubs, you know, the things that you're doing and the training hubs are really helping to support that, along with lots of other programs such as Phoenix program around where I am. Um, I don't have quite as many accolades as the other two of you, but um, I, I suppose that I suppose a little bit about the story, the point which I've ended up in here, and um, and the uh, and I think one of the big changes you can see in the bottom of the career, um, the bottom. Of, of the screen that actually lockdown has reduced the amount of hair that I have as opposed to having a bad mm -hmm. haircut. Um, but essentially I sort of look at my career pattern as going through lots of different phases and actually never really knowing what I want to do. Um, switching between peds and medicine and actually finding that um, well, even though I didn't go along those routes I still sort of wanted to plant a seed of, of thought and interest and that's something that's kind of carried me through towards roles later on. Um, moving into GP training and not exactly knowing what to do or where I might want to go has le has led to, I suppose, lots of different opportunities. Um, Travelling, locum, and then finding that getting involved in the first five, in the RCGP first five, and being um, elected to the um, the local Vale of Trent board has opened lots of doors um, to, to a portfolio career. Um, although I've managed to do this alongside all the other stuff that I've been doing, just as Serena was saying, actually by finding ways to help manage it, finding those opportunities and the way to go, um, you, can, you can help create those opportunities for you. So um, I ended up with the, the training hub and in the salary job, and also doing some education through the HE fellowship scheme, uh, which is sort of morphing as we're going across the country. Um, um, and, and then moving again into sort of the, the current things that I do now, which I think I probably only do six or seven as opposed to Serena's 35-ish, it seems. 40 maybe. 14 <laughs> seems like quite a lot to me. Um, but the, re the reason I kind of put this on here is that for anybody thinking that, that the path to is like, you know, I want to be uh, have a GP with a portfolio in 
education, have a GP with a portfolio in, I don't know, pediatrics or emergency medicine, actually you bounce around a lot. W would you agree with that, uh, Serena and Mel? Yeah, I think um, you, the, the continuity side, so although I do do like a kind of larger number of roles than, yeah. than you do, I think um, one thing with portfolio careers is they can be very like really busy at one point or just for oh, a yeah. short amount of time. Mm -hmm. So say for the Macmillan role, that's until December. And then, you know, we don't think or know if there's going to be funding for it after that. But for me, I've always treated each phase as a learning point that I've learned something new about it and then I'll move on or I'll grow kind of forward. I know some people have been asking about um, no fellowship opportunities in their area like Birmingham. I think Mel, you're going to talk about how they can engage or, or how things can mm. get set up and, and what the process is to get it in. And I think the reason why a lot of you have signed up for this today is because you don't know how to access things or things aren't happening in your area yet. And actually, Mel's one of the people that often makes that happen in areas. So um, she'll talk about that shortly, I think. I, I mean, I, th I think that in terms of getting some of this stuff going, that the two, the two factor is, um, is, it, is it either, um, uh, does it not exist yet? In which case, there's lots of areas of the country and across the UK, including Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, where it is in its early stages, but is being built. And then in a lot of cases, actually had trying to access that doesn't is not necessarily so straightforward um and oh yeah well, well that that's this is where i've got advice these these green arrows um it's from a from a different presentation this is where i've had sort of advice as to where to go um but has resulted in a very sort of very career in education and uh, leadership um sort of uh, development as well in the rcgp the phoenix program up at the right hand part of this screen as well and it's very fulfilling really it was very interesting um but, but it's quite odd that and, and that's the thing that's sort of same with mel that part of my portfolio career is helping to link people into these things in the nottinghamshire area and also sort of promoting it um across the country so that was a probably a little bit of a longer kind of jaunt through <laughs> the, the backgrounds to this than we were sort of expecting um, but i think that what's really clear is that it's been complicated do you think so, Serena? Yes, it's been complicated. And I think in it, like originally, say when I started a few years ago trying to develop a portfolio career, it was a case of just try, like emailing the CCG, seeing yeah. if they needed any help with anything and then building connections. Whereas now I think from what Mel's going to discuss, it's going to be a much more structured pathway. You know, some areas are developing it fast. So South West London and, and Nottingham kind of are, are developing a much more consolidated faster pathway but there's no reason why say when I started there was no real pathway I just kind of linked into um, things as I went along um, so we can talk about sourcing that well you know sourcing work and how you do it when we get to that slide and we'll definitely cover cover that mm. so I think one of the questions that we're often asked is what types of roles can you put into your portfolio um, and I think probably I, I would say it can be anything you like, to be quite frank. There are multiple doors, some of which are related to uh, medicine, some of which are related to things that are associated with that. Um, and a huge amount of choice and can be quite baffling. And when I was thinking about this, I sort of split it into four larger areas, leadership, clinical education and non-clinical. But actually, this is a non-exhaustive list um, and I'm sure people might you know even pop in the chat at other thoughts that you've had about different types of portfolio options but you know private work sports medical legal locum work entrepreneurial like Serena salaried um, working for the CCG the ICS as I do um, so but, I think a good point with this slide is for portfolio roles that it is a job it's not like it's just an extra thing to escape your patients it's a role that you develop and you commit to and i think the key points are so both you and me james have done things we've been genuinely interested in and i know mel for the pathways you're developing you're finding the key things like what is it your is it dermatology and was it pediatrics and gynecology or dermatology sexual health mental health um emergency medicine so um, if CP yeah. applied to you Mel and said look I want to do that but I don't want to do 
this specialty, I'm really interested in pediatrics. Would you then be able to help them make that possible? Connection. Or is it really, pres- is it really prescriptive? So in, it's different in different parts of the country. So there is obviously variation that we know about. In mm-hmm. Southwest London, we will be able to do that through the training hubs. So there are six boroughs in Southwest London and we each have a training hub lead. And we are each well connected with our local stakeholders to, to facilitate those conversations and broker um, the discussion about creating a fellowship job. Um, in our most recent fellowship application process we've just sent out last week, we are placing the onus on employers to, to, uh, uh, to want to create a fellowship. Um, but to answer your question simply, yes, of course. Um, we're, we know we have key contacts in um, hospital, in community health service providers, mental health, so primary, secondary and tertiary care. So we're, we are there to help uh, with those links. Would you, would you agree that um, the, 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 the uh, training hubs and the like tend to attract can-do type peoples, um, Mel? So we'll, we'll make it happen. Yeah, of course. So that's um, part of uh, the new model of training hubs yeah. which started in 2014 is around, um, it's a vehicle through which to support workforce development that's not really constrained by a CCG or um, a trust. It's a, it's a freestanding entity uh, that sits outside of um, those usual kind of hierarchical structures. Most training hubs are made up of only a handful of people, perhaps two or three, um, and are really, you know, personality is all, all about it. It's getting things done and making it happen. It is, and Serena, just going back to one of the questions um, about how to access, mm-hmm. um, you still, as a, as a locum, you still do need to build relationships. You still do need to be proactive. Um, just going and seeking out who is our lead training hub, who, who do I need to talk to? So that does take a certain amount of um, proactiveness from the locum. But yes, there are pathways now that are slowly being formed in different areas, uh, the different schemes, depending on where you are. So finding out what, what is in your area is really important. Um, if, um, if people want to contact myself after this webinar today um, to perhaps get some more links and find out more, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, if, they, if people are in a particular area, because I know some people said, say, in Birmingham and other areas, there's nothing. Are you able to help set those things up in different areas, similar to what you're doing elsewhere? Yes, I would be able to. Because I have my own company, um, I can do that. But other, failing that, of course, I can help with the linkages through HEE and NHSE as well, if they are applicable. I think there was another question for you, Mel, um, which was, um, so someone said that they missed a bit about NHS fellowships, and it sounds really interesting. Are there any resources you can direct them to? Uh, yes, so it depends. Um, so we've just launched the Southwest London Fellowships last week. We sent out the paperwork to all practices, so to all employers in Southwest London. And depending on the area that that individual is from, their their fellowship, because there is a fellowship scheme for every STP, um, their scheme may have a different time of launch, um, mm-hmm. and will have different people that that are delivering it. Mm-hmm. So they if they can let me know who they are and where where they are, then we can try and um, help them. I, I think probably the advice I'd give, um, because um, it sounds like things are really well developed um, in South West London, you're really forging ahead, but there are training hubs. If <laughs> That's I'm, mainly uh, down to Mel, it's got nothing to do with <laughs> it. <laughs> the, the, the I just gave her the platform <laughs> and the locums, <laughs> and she just went... <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely, and and the, the de- and this is doing something you love and doing something uh, what you can achieve if you're you've got the drive to get there. Um, yeah. But correct me if I'm wrong. Are there? I think there are training hubs across the country. Is that right? So I think if people in other areas of the country, um, and including in you know in um, in Scotland and Northern Ireland as and Wales as well, um, if they wanted to get started with this, actually finding their local training hub would be a really good place to start, I would expect. And um, certainly that's one of the ways that we can help people in Nottingham. We've got a sort of, we've got a, an ally to them in the Phoenix programme, but I know that in other areas of the country, in Cambridge and, 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 and various other places, that that's how you go about getting it. Yeah, Cambridge, I know Cambridge LMC do, they've got their own training hub, but the LMC do fantastic stuff. Yeah. Um, I would, I would definitely contact them again, you know, Oxford, lots of areas like, yeah, yeah you could start with training hubs in the LMC. Um, 
someone's asking about finding out more information on the South London Fellowship Program and for your email address, Mel. Well, sure. So, in <laughs> uh, can I say there's about 133, if I remember correctly, training hubs in England, and um, they used to be called CEPNs, Community Education Provider Networks. Mm -hmm. So, you're looking if you want to Google and look for your training hub. It might be called CEPN because training hub is it's kind of a new term we only started using a year ago. It was always called CEPNs before that, or CPENs in some parts of the country. Yeah. Um, but and and if you don't even know w w um, where to start with finding your training hub, if you can contact your local HEE office, they they manage training hubs. So so HEE manages the local training hubs and can tell you exactly who your local um, training hub manager person is. Yeah. And also, Mel and James, you mentioned something really important, which is a lot of these schemes are in the pipeline. So obviously, South West London and Nottingham are on it and they're out and, you know, they're, they're kind of leap, leaping ahead. But a lot of other areas are that it's still in development, which means if you guys contact these people yeah. and say, listen, I'm really interested in a portfolio role in X, Y and Z. Yeah. Um, you you probably won't have any other candidates to comp compete against because you're already there with all your documents and your CV and you're you know you're there to take the job. So I think you but, should probably just go ahead now and just uh, just start. Obviously not now after yeah, the webinar because we're going to deal with a few it. more important bits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get in on the ground floor and and help create it. And if you're passionate, you you get there. I mean, I think that I mean. So the next bit on on our list here was um, about sourcing work, and I think we've we've covered quite a lot of that. And um, this next slide here, uh, which we can of course pause on if people want to look at it, I think is uh, the outline for your training hub. Is that right, Mel? Yes. Thank yeah. you very much. So I don't want to waste too much time, but um, it is useful to know that training hubs exist and what they used to be called, as, as I said before, CEPNs, and the purpose of them, because they are fairly new in the grand scheme of um, primary care. Five years ago, they weren't really around, and now they're these new budding organizations, um, which are there to support workforce development and transformation in primary care. We organize and coordinate education and training, so CPD, which might be webinars, but it may also be um, in Wandsworth, at least, and, and Merton, we do um, GP locum forums. So we run uh, a, like an evening session so that it doesn't affect your day work, uh, perhaps um, from like 6.30 to 9.30. And we have different speakers come in and talk about diabetes, the pathways and things like that. So as I said right at the beginning, we really recognize that locums are a, um, a, a, a part of the workforce that are not going anywhere. So... We can't ignore them and we try and offer um, continuing professional development for them. Um, so we have our Locum GP forums. We also run borough-based inductions. So in Southwest London, we run an induction for Wandsworth, for Kingston, for Richmond. So it's a, it's a morning, it's like half a day, where anyone that's working in that borough, doesn't matter if you're health, social care, if you work for the council, if you work for charity and voluntary sector organizations, they come and they each have a speaking slot to kind of give an overview yeah. of what it means to work in Wandsworth. Yeah. So you'll hear from the CCG and kind of really our locums are all invited to get that picture of where I work and how I fit into the scheme of things. So that's a borough based induction. We have our CPD, as I mentioned, hmm. and um, we have really good uh, collaborative working in South Sun with the six boroughs, the training hubs, the six of us, uh, yeah. which are a little bit, um, is a little bit different to some of the other parts of the country. And plus, as mentioned, my local manager. So we have my local manager who offer online monthly teaching for the locums, there's things like that. So we're always thinking about how can we support our locums. So if, if someone wanted to get this set up in their area, because it sounds like you're doing a huge amount of stuff for locums in your area, would you be happy for, for pe perhaps people to seek you out and find out how you got started to take that to their other bits of the country? And would that be something you'd be... Absolutely. Um, like, uh, an, a, 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 for, a force it's, to be reckoned with to get things to get things changed and, and instigate that change around the country if it doesn't exist at the moment. For sure. It just yeah. takes a little bit of capacity and we bring that capacity uh, to the system and coordination as well. So definitely keen to, to work with anyone. We do share a lot of the work that we do because um, we're, we're better and stronger if we're all kind of, we just bring the bar up all of us together. Yeah, and, and I definitely would echo, echo that. I mean, so I so 
just in different terms of different workforce schemes, we've got the Phoenix program, which is alongside the LMC, which is also alongside our training hub. But I think that when this is working really well, we can all collaborate. And, and again, just as a very brief point, uh, because obviously we want to get to the questions for things, that we, we did an event last week, which brought all of this together. It's brought the training hub, which brought the Phoenix program and the Derbyshire. So we're going between different areas together with the RCGP to help new GPs, to help local GPs move forward. Um, and, and again, just popping this in, just to say that it, it is it is countrywide. It is a revolution, and we're moving forwards. And um, and there are schemes in Scotland as well for fellowships to help people in you know to to both uh, cover workforce roles, but also to help develop people's skills. To and I've noticed in the chat there are people talking about paediatrics and people talking about elderly care and the like. Actually, those are things that can be linked in to help you help the system and the system to help you. James, can yeah. you mention where in so someone I've missed the question, but someone did say um, what opportunities are there in Scotland and how would they find out about it? So um, what I can do is I'll pop it in the chat towards later. So it's yeah, sure. quite different. So different. I understand that they're organised quite centrally, um, but it would probably be easier. So I'll pop it in the chat with the link to it. Um, but there are rural schemes, but there are also central ones as well. But each area, um, I think they're called health boards in Scotland, run yeah. their different schemes. And yeah, I understand that. It'll be that your local health board you would get in touch with. So it's Isma yeah. actually who's asking anything yeah. in Scotland. I think if you get in touch with your local health board, yeah. um, and actually there's a really good website. If you just put local health board Scotland that lists all the local health boards and you just click and the email addresses are there. But um, I'll pop it in the chat so it'll be, uh, it'll be um, so you'll be able to access it. Hopefully that's the right for you. But you can, of course, ask questions directly and we'll try and get to it in a sec. Mm -hmm. So um, just time is marching on. Um, th this this section, I suppose, has been called the future. Um, what do you think the future for this is, uh, Serena? Um, hopefully, we're, we're going to try and get to the yeah. next. Question. So I think that I, I think a couple of interesting things are, are on the horizon actually for primary care. I think firstly, we can't ignore COVID, although everyone's sick of talking about COVID. What I will say with COVID is. I actually, I've always believed in that relationship between a GP, whether you be a locum or a salary GP or partner, and your practice and your community of practices. And, um, and I actually think that's going to get stronger. And I think practices are going to manage demand much better now because they've all gone online and they're all doing video consultations. So that crazy surplus of, ah, you know, overload, patient demand, I think is going to be managed a lot better and a lot more in-house so I think if you want to work locally now that's going to be the answer rather than flitting around from CCG to CCG doing a shift here shift there so I think developing local routes going forward is the way to develop any kind of career in general practice because of all the changes that have happened with COVID and the fact that now with remote working we're going to be managed demand a lot better now that then leads on to with regards to portfolio careers and I think Mel's mentioned a lot of interesting things that are happening and I think what's reassuring for me hearing that is that actually from the top down people recognize that as GPs we're very interested in a varied career yeah. but many of us just haven't known how to access it so actually Mel one thing I think makes me feel quite confident is that all these programs are happening and actually GPs like us need to start actually engaging with our training hubs and engaging kind of with the the organizations that are creating these roles to co-create them and actually apply and, and then make them what we want them to be. So I think the future is actually more variety. Yeah. Everybody from the government down to kind of, you know, your kind of grassroots GP is looking for ways to keep happy in the workplace, to retain the workforce and to grow the workforce. And I think one of the key ways to do that is through a portfolio career, whatever that might might be. That might be seeing patients, you know, for 10 sessions, but maybe partly, you know, doing minor surgery and partly doing face-to-face -face sessions or something like that. But I think definitely it will be a foundation for greater job satisfaction and, and retention going forward. Your thoughts, Mel? Do you reckon this is the future is in diversified or portfolio working? You muted. I'm afraid you muted, Mel. You muted again, Mel. <laughs> so I was just saying, now I'm feeling embarrassed. <laughs> I was just, um, absolutely, it was uh, Charles Handy who in the 60s said that by the 2000s we'd all be working in portfolio careers. So it's definitely the way forward. I mean, um, 
it's about retention. It's about sustainability. We, we are, we are living longer and we, the way we work has to change. So it's not just, you know, a three phase life anymore or a four phase life cycle. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, we have to work and, and live in a way that's sustainable that we can, we can kind of basically work forever then. <laughs> Sustain, sustainability for me is definitely the key. I think that, um, now I've managed to find things that I'm passionate about and that I'm really interested in. I can see myself doing what I'm doing now with all of these extra stuff and getting to have amazing conversations with, uh, with people um, and, uh, and, and kind of help provide those other opportunities to other people. I could see myself doing this, you know, for the next 35 years, whereas that can be more difficult, you know, in the situation we find ourselves in clinically where, you know, the, the challenges are increasing and, and this is a way for me to keep on working, but also, stay stay upright stay stay going which is nice the other thing to add um just around uh, once you do reach that phase of your career when you're um you know thinking about winding down your clinical work there are those other things that we spoke about the other role types so you may we may be able to retain some of our gps uh, in the workforce for longer if they're if they have the option to perhaps mentor and support the newer generation of gps Absolutely coming right. a huge uh, satisfaction from helping um, and showing the pathway for the future generation that's coming through. So it's not like you get to the end and that's it. There's also the, the coaching and the mentoring and there's training. You could actually decide, I want to deliver training as a GP now in the future. And that's a big part of the new to practice offer as well is that we are, you know, we're doing a, a lot of a sort of near peer education and support. And, and this is partly what this is as well. You know, that we are, uh, we are here to to help other people because we've been through it ourselves recently haven't we serena yeah definitely and i think i remember that feeling of kind of finishing vts and feeling really um just you know what what do i do now like how do i after years of being told which rotation i'm going to do where i'm going to do my training to then be told, well what do you want to do i was like i don't know do i get to make a decision i don't know how to think for myself anymore <laughs> and then thinking for yourself it's really liberating mel can i just ask you because you mentioned about the mentorship um do, actually for you and james like where can because i was part of the cohort that had access to free mentorship through the london deanery um and that was brilliant because i was at a point kind of towards the end of um gp training where i was a bit like oh i don't i don't know if i want to do a bit like your squiggly slide james i was a bit like oh i don't know if i really want to do this and they were actually the mentoring was really key in me staying in general practice and actually then carving my whole career what, like where can other GPs access that kind of mentoring? Change yeah. different places, different things around the country, I think. So it's probably worth saying for the listeners that the London Deanery is now Health Education England, just in case anyone kind of hasn't caught up. Um, okay. you... No, I haven't caught up, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I must have been on another webinar when that announcement was made. <laughs> so like I think 2010, 2012, <laughs> um, it used to be the London Deanery and it's now Health Education England. Okay. Um, England, Health Education England, and then there's local HEE offices. So there's HEE London. Um, so that's just the background. Uh, however, in, in Southwest London and probably in other parts of the country, as part of the GP retention program, mm -hmm. um, we in South London have allocated a portion of our funding to supporting, uh, to offering peer support, mentoring, and coaching specifically. Um, and that's open to you know, we were also thinking about um, returning after being on uh, maternity leave. So these kind of key points where you might want to have some support. So yeah. we've offered training for people who want to be coaches and mentors. And also we've offered coaching and mentoring for um, people who want to have that support. NHS England do also, as James mentioned, um, run some, some offers for coaching. But it is, um, you do have to look for that one. It's not really easy to find it's actually in a the last time I saw it was about three weeks ago in a weekly primary care bulletin that came out like that comes out on a Friday <laughs> right well I think I think um, Azra is probably awaiting to uh, post to us some of the questions uh, that have been popping up um, so um, I'll hand back over to you Azra thank you very much <laughs> Right, so thank you so much. That was really exciting. I, I think we can go forever with it. Uh, we really enjoy it, uh, and I believe everyone else as well uh, in the world joining our uh, webinar. Um, 
that was really sort of uh, insightful talk, exciting. Now then, we've got some questions that uh, uh, yourselves asked. So I'd like just to go through some of them if that's okay. I believe some of them you've already answered from the Q&A function bar. So we'll start from beginning. Um, uh, there was a question about how do I get rules working in urgent care centres, walking centres, hospital, a and &E. um, I believe, um, Serena, would you like to answer this question? Yeah. So I think now's a very interesting time because with market forces, competition is high. So my answer to any, for there was some questions about how do I, you know, which agency should I sign up? Where do I get a locum job? Where do I do urgent care? My answer for all these, so for urgent care and minor surgery, all those kinds of things, just Google your local urge. So for me, I don't know, I'd put, you know, urgent care Kingston, come up with the provider and every single provider on their website's got a recruitment email. So if you email them, they'll, Put you on board their system and they'll email you the jobs or, or send them out however they do before they go to an agency so you will be the first point of call before it goes out advertised oh anyone else can anyone else do it and i think going forward if you want to kind of create your more kind of self-employed income that's self-sustaining you're probably going to have to be a bit more proactive and i think me and james were talking about this the other day that you know, some people find it really strange. You've got to go market yourself or just approach. And it's like, that's how you get work. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, the passive way is just, oh, book, 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 whatever you're sent. But then you're one of many just all competing. So I think if you're looking for urgent care and things like that, just go directly. If you're in Southwest London, you can, you know, just sign up to MLM. And that, again, it's your direct relationship with the practices that you link in with across Wandsworth, yeah. all of who will support you, your build your relationships and many of our GPs go on to take on salaried roles which is amazing news that you know they carry on locoming but they often find that fit for them where they stay on for two or four sessions so I would just say my advice is do it yourself um, and just contact people directly because that's the best way of doing it and it, like if you're in southwest London and you want to sign up to MLM and build relationships that way you definitely can and again you're not competing or linking with practices that are there who will support you and they're looking for continuity so they're not looking for a different locum every day of the week they're looking for someone reliable that they can form a relationship with the way you can be their go-to um, GP so that that would be my response for that one well thank you so much uh, Serena for your um, for your advice I've got an interesting question here and I'm not quite sure would be able to I think I'll ask James um, uh, this question so how do your various portfolio rules affect your medical indemnity do you have any answer for this or shall we yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one because i yeah. actually was having this conversation this morning um with trying to get some identified the, the answer is it's a bit complicated um right. because um so if you're doing anything that's sort of medical related in a medical area um, then you would, and, and again, um, th this, this advice comes with a caveat of speak to the MDU and double check this or MPS or MDDUS um, to speak to them, um, but is generally covered by the, uh, the indemnity um, uh, that, that, we, that we received a little while ago. Um, however, there are certain things like, I didn't think I might need, like public liability and business insurance, uh, which actually are something worth exploring and something I'm in the process of. So I think my overall bit of advice is, one, speak to your, um, the MDU or equivalent, and secondly, um, actually consider what you might need for this, because that's a really interesting question, and it's possibly more than you think. Um, you probably possibly need more cover than you think. I'm not sure if uh, Serena- Can I add a small caveat to that? Yeah. yeah, so if you're doing additional roles, all you need to do, so obviously some of mine, like the teaching, the GP update stuff, and in um, some of our practices in Southwest London, we use a lot of physicians associates. So sometimes like the practices I know really well will say, could you supervise them, Serena, in your clinic, et cetera. So I had to call my indemnity provider and I just said, look, I I'm additionally doing, I don't know, some teaching for this company and I'm doing, I run the monthly webinars for MLM. So, you know, I'll be talking about and giving advice on that. And I'm doing this supervising role. And they added in a certain they added it into my cover and when i was like do i really need that they were like well if you're giving advice and someone follows your advice and something happens to a patient i was like yeah but i'm giving like nice guidance i didn't write the nice guidance i'm just telling people what it says but they were like well you know just to be mm. safe and i just thought do you know what just go on the side of caution yeah. but it is just having that conversation so that yeah. it's on your 
indemnity and therefore it can't be disputed but it's not difficult you just call them and you say I'm doing this other role I'm doing this fellowship and they'll just say okay and they make a note of it on the system and that's pretty much yeah. it really um there is a question uh, which I believe one of our colleagues uh, raised the, her hand or his hand but I'm going to just direct the question to Mel first to Melanie uh, and then we will we'll answer the uh, the other question so um, there is a question for if you don't want, first of all, uh, many of my colleagues are requesting to know your email address. So yes, I you can contact you directly for the, that's fine. So you if can, you don't mind. Yes. I've, posted, I've posted my email address in the comments section. I've got two. I've got an NHS email and then I have one for AIM Solutions, my company. Um, my NHS email is m dot ashdown at nhs.net and the other one is melanie at aimsoul.co.uk fantastic thank you very much so the question was asked um, if you don't want to take on a fellowship as that means a salary post for four or more sessions and you want to stay as a locum what opportunities are available will training hubs support portfolio roles for locums within their borough What's your thoughts, Mel? I think we've answered this question, but is there anything else you would like to add or advise, please? So I think that your training hub um, should help you. If, if a locum came to us and, and asked, where else might I be able to work that could give me X exposure experience, we would help them. That's, it's, not a, it's not a requirement of the training hub to do so, but I don't foresee anyone not being helpful. <laughs> The, the different areas have take different slightly different approaches yeah. to this um in and and it's and it's really about asking locally what you've got um i just sort of uh, picked up on one of the one of the comments in the chat that says that it seems like all the operate um all the opportunities are in london and nottingham um I, there is all kinds of stuff going on over all over the country loads and loads of things we just we just ha we couldn't get 28 people um as panelists in this but uh, there are lots of passionate, interested people here, around that can help you, can help you achieve this. Um, and I, I think going out and finding that is the really, really important thing. It, I, I, I guarantee there'll be op opportunities near to you, just sniffing those out. Uh, great places, and I said if I was to give you three, three places to go looking, would be Training Hub, LMC, and contact the RCGP, contact your local first five uh, uh, rep, contact uh, your local um, faculty um, and they should be able to help you out because there are people in the know so there are when we've highlighted a couple of bits here and um, today but there's stuff all over the place right thank you J james so i believe there is um one of our colleagues um raised his or her hand shall we shall you can you um unmute or shall bryn our admin um uh, unmute her oh. Oh, here's, I don't know, who is, who is she? Please. Uh, I think she's struggling. Right. Right, okay. So we apologize about this. I think, I think we are, well, very close to the eight o'clock. And uh, there is um, sort of, uh, uh, thank you so much. There is another sort of, uh, some useful, uh, resources that we would like to go through. Um, thank you so much for your time and your advice. It was really interesting uh, today, um, uh, your talks, and we've learned a lot. Um, and uh, I, I hope also that the, this, well, the, my colleagues um, have enjoyed it, uh, the webinar, listening to it. Um, now then, uh, if we can just get to our slide, uh, um, James, um, there is useful uh, resources um, which I'd like to share, which I believe would be really interesting, and uh, you will learn and uh, pick up a lot of uh, sort of information from, uh, which is the COVID-19 forum, the RCGP First Five resources, uh, Twitter, and the uh, the government uh, website. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please feedback to us. Um, with your thoughts, your um, your comments, your opinion, and we're looking forward to uh, see you on the first of July, uh, our third webinar. And uh, thanks everybody. Well, goodbye.
Great. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you very Thanks much. Goodbye. Cheers. And any questions we didn't get to, we'll endeavour to uh, endeavour to. I quickly to replied to a few of them, which were <laughs> yes, I am doing the next webinars in two weeks, yeah. and yes, just contact practices directly, call them, yeah. and then email the practice manager. And there was another one about partners. Can they get involved? And I just said email Mel. Thank you. Sorry, Mel. You're going to get all these emails now. <laughs> yeah. And people feel free to contact me um, via Twitter and the like. Um, it's good to connect. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks.